are joined by Baroness Saida Varsi, Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Bolton. Hello, how are you today? I'm good, I'm good, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Fabulous, thank you so much for joining us, it's a, such a privilege to be able to talk to you. Uh, well I hope I make it exciting and interesting and useful as well. I'm sure you will. So as you're aware that uh, we are doing these interviews with um, as many staff members across the University of Bolton and beyond um, talking about our education journey. Um, so I think that's where we're going to start is to ask how was education for you? Um, so for us, I think, I mean, I've said it before, education is the single biggest thing that changed the course of my life. I come from very humble beginnings. Uh, my dad uh, migrated to the UK from Pakistan in 1962 when he came to work in the mills in Yorkshire. And he had had a secondary school education. In fact, he'd had, I think, two years at college as well, but certainly not a university education. And my mom had had only a secondary school education. And, and they were... This was back in Pakistan. This was in Pakistan. And they were adamant that they wanted us to have a university education. And so I think from quite a young age, uh, the importance of having a university education was drilled into us. Um, and my mum... Why was that so important, the university part of the education for your family? I think it, it, it was a sense that that's where a university education was what really allowed you to make huge choices, whereas they felt that they had a, a limited education either at a secondary level or at college level, but they felt that a university education would really qualify you for the professional roles as they would talk about it. So there were certain roles that my family would always talk about, you know, they they wanted their kids to be doctors or lawyers or accountants or engineers. And that was the kind of remit that was set for you. And I'm one of five girls. And my mum decided quite early on that all five of us were going to go to university. And she would talk about saying, I need you to go out and get me five degrees. Oh. And so she really saw it as, uh, as her kind of thing and something that she needed to achieve, but we needed to go and get it for her. Wow. Is that to sort of set you apart from everybody else by getting degrees? Yeah, and I think it was because we didn't have any graduates in the family, it, you know, a university education was something that was seen as so far away from their everyday lived experiences, both in Pakistan and certainly in the UK, and therefore this was the kind of pinnacle of what they thought could be achieved, but it wasn't just about the education, it was an education with a view to then having an output at the end of it, so it wasn't that you just went and did, you know, a degree in maths or accounts, it was to become an accountant. Um, and when we were quite young, she sat us all down and she basically gave us our careers. So she just went, I want you to be a teacher, a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, a pharmacist. Um, and that's what, you know, at least four of the five of us went on to do. Oh, that's amazing. Was that a lot of pressure? Um, no, it wasn't pressure, actually, because I think I grew up in an era where a lot of um, women and certainly women from Asian communities were not being encouraged to go to university. Um, and therefore, the kind of challenge of my generation was the fight to go to university. So therefore, if we had, you know, because we had parents who were saying, you really must go to university, we felt quite privileged that we weren't having to fight to get there. And the fact that it might be pressurized was so far away from our mind. Just that we just felt we were, we were you know, given such a huge opportunity that we couldn't see any downsides to it at all. That's fantastic. So how did you find your school education? Was it something that was quite easy for you to think you were going and, and complete a university education? So I um, I don't know if your listeners want to listen to hear this, but I wasn't a great student at school. I was quite badly behaved. Um, because I think I was bored. Um, I, I, I mean, I got great O levels uh, results. Um, I got some of the best O levels in the school, but throughout my time at school, I was constantly in trouble um, because I used to chatter in class and I used to, I used to disturb people because I was bored. I mean, I really was not stretched, and I just felt that the learning experience wasn't exciting me, and therefore, I think because of that, I got myself into trouble all the time. Um, 
can absolutely relate to that. My report card is Lindsay could try harder and stop talking. <laughs> yeah, well, that's my report card. If she just concentrated more and stopped, uh, you know, talking in class, stopped disturbing other people in class. Um, and then I think when I got to my A-levels, um, I was much clearer, you know, I was, I was much more challenged. Um, and I uh, and I also had a clear focus. I needed to get a A's to get to university. Uh, I went on to study law um, and then really studied law at the University of Leeds for three years after that. Okay. Thinking about your transition from high school to A-levels, would your interest have been peaked more because it's the subject that you've chosen and you now have an outlook as opposed to in school? It's very generic, isn't it? You're kind of told what subjects you're going to you're going to do. It was, and the subjects that I chose were one of interest to me, but was secondly were quite um, demanding. And because of that, I think I, I, I got my head down because I really felt like I was now being challenged to work hard. And the people that I was working alongside were incredibly bright. And so there were quite small classes actually during my A-levels. So small classes with some fantastic teachers in interesting, challenging subjects. And therefore, I felt like that was a much more, probably of all the learning experiences, whether it was um, school, college or university, I think college was the one that I enjoyed the most. Brilliant. So did you go to a college as opposed to a sixth form? Yes. Okay, fantastic. And you mentioned that you then went to the University of Leeds. Was Leeds always your first choice? No, so I actually got into the University of Sheffield um and I I think my grades were better than it were predicted and so because of that I decided that I I I, I went to Sheffield and I didn't really like the city and so I rang up the unit the law department in the days that you could long before clearance um and said oh you know I'd like to come down and I'd like to come to the University of Leeds and I was invited for an interview um, and I went for the interview and they gave me the place there and then and I joined Leeds instead. Brilliant. Uh, now you mentioned that your degree path was sort of instigated by your mum. However, was law something that you were incredibly interested in? Um, I think she chose according to our personalities and, you know, my personality and my, I was a huge reader as a, as a young person, still am actually. So I think she felt that that was the space for me. And so, uh, and I was always very talkative, very argumentative. I'm always up for a discussion. So I think she chose it, but instinctively it was the right one for me. What area of law interested you the most? So I went on to specialise in criminal, uh, I, I went on to actually do my training contract with the Crown Prosecution Service. So I prosecuted for a couple of years, then went into defence work um, and then specialised in criminal defence um, and mental health. Um, and I used to represent before the mental health panel. Um, and then we did some uh, immigration and refugee work. Um, I did some human rights work, a little bit of family work. It was a high street practice, but predominantly um, criminal defence and mental health. That's amazing. So how did, just skipping back a little bit, how did you find your degree? How, how was that for you? So I didn't enjoy university, uh, interestingly, because um, it, at the end of, uh, uh, towards the end of the second year or mid second year, I ended up getting married. And uh, it was an arranged marriage and it felt okay at the time. Um, it didn't work out. And, you know, I'm now looking back on it, realize it, I, it probably didn't feel right from the outset. Um, but because of that, I didn't have what would be a normal student existence because I ended up having a home with someone else and we were married. It was a very different existence to what would have been, I think, a, a kind of a, a rounded university experience. Of course. Yeah, of course. And that was towards the end of your second year, did you say? Yeah, that was in my second year. So first year was, uh, you know, I kind of got involved in loads of different things. Second year, I ended up getting married. Third year, I was married and then it was finals. Um, and so I kind of don't really recall much about my kind of university experience in the way that I think people have a well-rounded university experience. Yeah, you've started with the student life and then ended with the married life, which is, of course, very different, isn't it? Different responsibility. Yeah. Was it, how was it to finish your degree? Were you given the, the, the sort of time and space to be able to complete it 
to the best yeah. of your ability. So I think once I'd completed my degree, I then interestingly went away. I took a year out and uh, worked uh, actually in various legal jobs to get a sense of what I really wanted to do. And then I ended up going away to do my uh, professional exams and probably had much more of a student experience living away uh, and really kind of living like a single person again uh, when I was at the College of Law. Um, and then, but by that stage, I'd already managed to secure a training contract. So I kind of have it, had a clear sense of where I was heading as well. What was it that drew you towards um, the, the CPS, Crown Prosecution Service? Um, uh, so at, at the time that I was graduating, um, it, the climate for jobs was great, uh, probably kind of not dissimilar to what we're going through now. And it was the early 90s, there, there were kind of challenges about recruitment and we, most people were applying for hundreds and hundreds of jobs before they were getting a job interview. And I applied for this job. Um, I think it was my first or it was, it was my first or second job. So I'd applied for about two at the same time and I got a job interview and I got the job. And so in, in a lot of ways, I think I was just grateful to have a training contract and it was quite an unusual training contract that because it was in the Crown Prosecution Service, although they employed you and you were you were um, you were under their umbrella for two years, a year of it, you were allowed to go off and spend in other places. So I went and did um, a stint with the Home Office Immigration Department. And I also went on and did a stint in private practice. So it was a really great kind of training program where you had the stability of a two year training program, but the flexibility to go off and do lots of experience during that. That's amazing. Um, okay. You mentioned you went from um, a CPS into defense work, is that correct? I did, well, so, the well, so part of my training contract was with um, a, a private practice and at the end of my time with them I was coming to the end of my training contract and they offered me a um, uh, a job and it was um, it was uh, bigger, bigger and better than the job that the Crown Prosecution Service offered me so um, I took it and went into private practice. Wow I know there's, there's quite a lot of talk around um, sometimes with defence solicitors um, with regards to being able to represent so some criminals, as it were. How do you feel about that? So I think for me, because I'd prosecuted for a number of years and I'd, I'd seen both sides of the argument, I actually realised that how, you know, there are people who, you know, need proper representation because there are ways in which cases are investigated, which don't necessarily mean that the person in the dock is the person that shouldn't be in the dock. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if, uh, and, and, and not everything is black and white, you know, uh, if anybody's been watching in the line of duty, we all know there is such a thing as bent coppers as well. So. No spoilers, no spoilers. I'm not no watching spoilers. it. Yeah, I'll have to binge on it. <laughs> oh, you're going to watch it. It's an amazing. I mean, the thing is, as a lawyer watching it is terrible because I spend my whole time saying to my husband, no defence lawyer would do that. Mm -hmm. That is not accurate. And it's like, I'm sorry, this is not a law programme. This is actually, this is entertainment. And you're spoiling the entertainment by giving me technical advice, which I really don't need when we're watching a, when we're watching a drama series. It wouldn't um, be exciting if it was uh, exactly true to that. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, I think, you know, ultimately, everybody des deserves the right to a fair trial, and it's innocent until proven guilty. So I think, you know, we definitely need um, both sides of that, don't we? we need the press exactly. And the, the, the exactly. And also, I think, I mean, I also grew up in the era where, I mean, this is probably too old for you guys, but I also grew up in an era where LA Law was a big thing. It was a big drama series in the US. And I kind of fashioned myself as one of these really front foot to defense lawyers I spent ages or you know going down hunting down witnesses taking crazy witness statements from places at times where I really should not be there so yeah I kind of really saw myself as quite a proactive front-footed defense lawyer and it was exciting I was in my 20s you know I was I was an advocate I was in court mm -hmm. um so I had a great time really and then interestingly within um within about six months a year of joining this private practice one of the it was um it was a medium-sized practice and they had three officers but one of the senior partners there decided that he was going to leave to set up his own specialist practice wow. and so he said to me look you know you're kind of building up a name for yourself and a client base would you consider coming and working for me when I set up this new practice 
Um, and I just took a cheeky punt and I said, well, if it's a new practice, why would I come and work for you? Why wouldn't I come and work with you? And why wouldn't I actually be a partner in the new business that you're setting up? Wow. And uh, he kind of was taken quite aback and he said, you know, well, there'd obviously have to be a financial buy-in because of, of, he had goodwill and a client base already and I was quite junior. Um, and I did and I ended up buying into 50% of that business and ended up owning half of that business in my late 20s. How amazing. But it just shows that when opportunity presents, you know, just kind of, yeah, take a cheeky punt. What, they can only say no. Go for it. Absolutely. I think that's great advice. How did you find um, your early career being an Asian female? How was that in the long run? I think it, there was a good side and a bad side to it. So the bad side to it was people underestimated you all the time. They, you know, there was a there was a view they had about you, stereotypical views about Asian women that they superimposed upon you before they'd even met you. Um, and so often, you know, uh, I would speak to people I'd been in court with afterwards would say, oh, you know, that was, um, I didn't see that one coming, uh, at, you know, when we'd had, when I'd just won a trial. And I think it was because they came in and underestimated me. Um, so that was the bad side of it. The good side of it is that uh, it was still such a novel thing to see a, a young Asian woman in police stations and prison cells as a defence lawyer that actually people didn't ever forget you and clients never forgot you. So they asked for you again. And, and so you did stand out. You did have a USP that made you stand out. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. What advice would you have for any... Um, young Asian females today entering into this world? I would say that, look, you know, the, the, the world is open to you in a way that it wasn't for us. You can find out so much more about jobs and roles and you can work anywhere in the world. In fact, you can be sat in your pajamas in your front room and work anywhere in the world these days because of what technology allows you to do. But interestingly, find, find your USP uh, very early on and and throw yourself into things which are scary and which you think, you know, are not within your comfort zone because it's then that you'll really kind of find yourself and, and fly and you never know where your career will take you. I mean, if I take my career, you know, started off as a lawyer, um, ended up setting up my own business as a lawyer, ended up then selling that business back to my business partner who had actually bought it from in the first place oh, and wow. therefore put, put myself in a really great financial kind of stable position in my early 30s, then went uh, and ended up working abroad for a year. So I, uh, in my kind of early 30s, my marriage, which I've kind of briefly spoken about, didn't work out in the end. Um, and I, kind, I had what I would call probably an early midlife crisis. And I sold my legal practice and put myself in a position where I didn't need to work for a while and I ended up going overseas, ended up working for a human rights project overseas and then eventually ended up setting up a charity um, which focused on providing support for women who were widows or orphan girls or divorcees, some of the most marginalized women in society in Pakistan uh, because I felt that really my life at that stage, so I was you know, uh, a young woman with a young child, divorce, what would what would my life have been really had I been in that position in Pakistan where my parents originally came from? So I ended up setting up this uh, charity, which is still going, the Severa Foundation. 20 years on, we've put 30,000 women through an economic empowerment program. We've just built the first purpose-built women's centre in rural Punjab. It's going from strength to strength. And having had my kind of gap year in my early 30s um, I decided to come back home and that's when I uh, was talent spotted to stand for a seat for politics. Wow how did that feel? Well I, I mean I'd been involved in politics all my life so I was vice pre president of the students union when I was at college I'd um, always been in, involved in issues uh, but never party politics until my kind of late 20s uh, and I was at party conference at a conservative party conference in my 30s, um, speaking at a fringe event when um, uh, somebody came over to me, actually Oliver Letwin's um, uh, researcher came over to me and said, you know, would you consider standing as a candidate? Um, and I said I would, but I'd like to stand in my hometown, which was Dewsbury. And so I threw myself into the selection process, ended up getting selected to fight Dewsbury for the 2005 election. 
Um, didn't win. It wasn't a seat that we'd held, I think, except for on one occasion on a fluke, although we hold it now. And um, during that time, I ended up meeting Michael Howard, got involved in the national program, uh, the national campaign. And then after 2005, when I didn't win the election, I had uh, Michael Howard invited me up to, uh, to London to have a conversation and invite in, and introduce me to a young man called um, David Cameron. Who is that man? Exactly. And I got involved in David's selection campaign to be leader of the Conservative Party and introduced him actually when he did his big keynote speech in Blackpool to, to set out his stall to be leader. Uh, and sometimes it's just right place, right time and ended up uh, becoming vice chairman uh, under David's leadership. And then he asked me to join the House of Lords and join his shadow cabinet. Wow. Could you ever imagine that would happen to you when you think you're back in high school? Not, not when I was getting detentions at school, no. <laughs> oh, no. And I think the, um, you know, when, when that happened, I was 36. I became the youngest member of the House of Lords. Um, and I became the first Muslim to join the cabinet or shadow cabinet at that point. And uh, we ended up having a two, three year campaign that took us into the 2010 election. And then you'll recall, we formed a coalition government uh, with the Liberal Democrats. And David asked me to become chairman of the Conservative Party and also to join the cabinet as a, as a cabinet minister. And again, you know, ha had the privilege of becoming Britain's first Muslim cabinet minister in 2010. Uh, which I think for me was a was a really kind of breathtaking moving moment because it's not the kind of thing that the daughter of an immigrant mill worker in Dewsbury grows up thinking she's ever going to become to take a seat at the top table in the land. No, it's amazing. It's such a pivotal moment, isn't it? Mm, it was it was for me. I mean, I still look back on it. And I remember going to my first cabinet meeting and it was a beautiful summer's day and uh, just sauntering up Downing Street in a, in a silk pink shalvar kameez and it made it onto the front pages of all the newspapers the next day because yeah i kind of didn't realize that just how many photographers there would have been there and how wearing a pink silk outfit was probably not the first thing to be wearing to a cabinet meeting no but well, that's an amazing picture for people to see out there isn't it i think it is important lindsay because i think it's important for you to remain true to yourself Absolutely. and i think the one, one of the things that i've been always really um you know, aware of throughout my legal career and, you know, charitable work and, and political work is that you have to be, if you are breaking barriers and you are breaking ceilings and you're the first one often taking up these roles, then you have to be, you have to make sure that people who are looking at you see you as an authentic version of who they are and don't see you as somebody who's detached and removed from their lives. And I think you know, the fact that I did on many occasions wear shawar kameez or saris in public life meant that a lot of young women, especially women, Asian women, would, would, would write in and um, would say that that really mattered to them because they, they felt they could be something that they could see. Oh, and it's, relatable. it's absolutely relatable, isn't it? It's something that they can relate to and aspire to be. Exactly. And I, I think that's why I often talk about you know, my beginnings and what life was like and, 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 and how it wasn't unlike many, many of the students that come to Bolton. You know, it's one of the reasons why I took up the role at Bolton. Um, I mean, it's no secret, you know, I had, uh, I had offers from other universities, but for me, this mattered because I felt that I was working with a university who was providing opportunities for people like me, you know, work, people from working class backgrounds, working people from minority ethnic backgrounds, people from um, you know, families where you're not allowed to live away from home, but you were going to, you know, your university experience was was going to be had whilst you were living at home in the family home. So I, I just felt that it was it was something that I could relate to and hopefully add value to with my own experience. Yes, completely. You mentioned earlier that you were in the right place at the right time. And how, I have to challenge that statement because sometimes I think we, we like to do ourselves a disservice, don't we, by saying, oh, I was just in the right place at the right time. Well, actually, no. You were the person who was right for that. And I think you were chosen for those reasons. And to then sort of change from that person into, you know, changing your outfit or changing the person you are to think, to be the person that you think needs to fit the role. Well, that's not why you were chosen. That's not why people vote for you. That's not why people want you to be in that position. So I think it's a very important that you stay true to yourself because that's who people want. I do. And I suppose what I would say by pushing back is that, 
you can be in the right place at the right time, but you've also, I think on top of that, have got to be prepared to, to um, when you see, you've got to be able to see the opportunities that present Lindsay, and then you've got to be brave enough to take them. Absolutely. So I could, Just so I was, brilliant. yeah, exactly. So I was at the, you know, when somebody came up to me and said, would you, I was at the right place at the right time when somebody came over and said, would you fancy standing for parliament? I, I then took hold of that and then I thought right this is an opportunity I could really I could really add value here and I was brave enough and you know had the I suppose gumption to say I'm going to do this to take that leap but they wouldn't just have asked anybody that's the other side of the coin isn't it they haven't mm. just thought oh let's have a look here who we're going to choose you've been looked at for a reason and a purpose and and that's absolutely who you need to be and stay true to that I, I love that thought yeah exactly and then obviously um still now in the house of lords but gave up my job in government in 2014 um i was at the time uh, in the minute in the um, foreign office i was the minister for human rights and for the icc the international criminal court and for uh, the un and we uh, there was a huge foreign policy decision that I fundamentally disagreed with the government on. I felt that the government was even li living by its own principles on human rights and international accountability. And I think at that moment, I felt, again, I had to be true to myself. And long after politics had come and gone, I had to be able to live with the decisions that I made. And I wasn't prepared to defend what I thought were bad government decisions. So I resigned and um, I ended up um, obviously remaining as a parliamentarian, but then carrying on with my business career. So throughout all of this work in the background, I've always stayed involved in business and been involved in various businesses, um, including two in the service sector, two in manufacturing. I'm still involved with another two businesses at the moment. Um, and I think business excites me. I think the ability to start something and make it grow and either sell it or still you know run it excites me i think that concept of creating something um and so yeah i i, I and then of course i then got involved with uh, the university um as a pro vice chancellor and again this excites me because in a lot of ways you know it is it, there are a lot of overlap between business and, and, and universities. Universities have to be able to run as effective institutions, uh, both, you know, commercial institutions as well as effective institutions that provide services that are fit for purpose for what they're set up to do. And I think for me, it's been really exciting to see what the university has been able to offer and to play a role in that. Um, as well as that, I'm a, I'm a, a visiting professor at the University um, of uh, at St Mary's in Twickenham and uh, have kind of outreach into lots of the universities in the US and in Australia as well. So I've, had, I've really had the privilege of having a great academic um, or a career within the academic space, not as an academic, but actually bringing my own skill set to the academic world. Yes, of course. What um, What's your plans for the future? What visions do you have? Oh, uh, so last year in lockdown, I think I must have been bored out of my head, and um, I decided to take part in a television program um, called Stand Up and Deliver, which was um, five people in public life were, were paired up with five comedians, uh, and they were we were taught the art of stand up. And at the end of it, we had to do a live gig and raise money for cancer research. And uh, this was all televised. <laughs> and I decided to get involved and I won. And so I, I am now a winner of, an, of a, a stand. I'm now officially a stand up comedian kind of so I can do a five minute gig basically I'm not a stand-up <laughs> comedian but the, uh, the upshot of that was I had such a great time we raised money for such a great cause it was something completely out of my comfort zone uh, and I had such great fun doing it and um, I've been uh, you know off the back of that um, I've had some really interesting offers and I now do regular television so I do a program called Steph's Pack Lunch um, uh, once sometimes twice a week it's a daytime TV program, and uh, I've been. I did a, a winter walks program recently, and we're currently in the process of uh, working on three documentaries, which over the next year or so, hopefully, will come to fruition. So, yeah, t television. 
uh, with a purpose, I think is, is, is what I'm kind of part-time doing at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hit 50, Lindsay, uh, this year, and I kind of thought, right, it's time to do something completely different and also probably have a bit more fun as well in my career rather than it just being a job. That seems like so polar opposites, conservative and then going into TV. You've just seen a comedian. You are now a comedian. <laughs> Yeah. I know and, and I think that's what you know th this is why this podcast is so important Lindsay because it's your way of saying to people that you might think you've got it all worked out but interestingly life will take you on such interesting adventures you never know where your career is going to turn out you know when I was in my comprehensive school in Dewsbury being terribly badly behaved in my teenage years I could never have thought that I would have had multiple careers. And one of the things that I do say to people is you will have multiple careers in your life and you need to have the confidence to be able to let go of the last one and, and reach out for the next one. I call it a trapeze moment. I talk to my kids about it a lot. And it's that trapeze moment where you have lot, let, let go of the last and, and reached out for the next. And you're kind of suspended in midair, not knowing what's going to happen next. But that's what makes it so exciting. And that's when you end up reaching out for something that is so outside and different to what you've done before. And then you move on to what could be exciting thereafter. And as long as you throw your everything at each job that you do, and as long as when you're in that job, you are authentic and you are brave in the way you do that role and you're challenging yourself and others around you when you're doing that role, then not only will you get the most out of it, but the organization, institution or the people that you're working with will hopefully get something out of it as well. Yes, of course. What is it that's given you the confidence to be able to do that? Because, you know, to take that trapeze moment and to sort of make that leap and, and, and go with the opportunities as they present themselves, that's quite scary, especially if you're perhaps in a sort of secure job that you're not happy with. How, mm. what is it that's been there that's given you that confidence to think, come on, I'm going to do this? Because it seems I think you've taken so many trapeze moments and it's absolutely <laughs> yeah. worked out for you. Yeah, I mean, I think two things. First of all, um, I think because I started off in, in, in pretty much relative poverty, uh, my sense always was it's always going to be better than this, isn't it? And I think because you start off with so little, everything is a bonus. Yes. And, and I think that's what makes you quite bold because you kind of think, well, I'm going to fight for this because, yes. uh, you know, what I've got to do better than this and it's got and, and there's going to be a way out of this. Uh, and secondly, I think because I was incredibly lucky in my 20s and 30s that I that my careers allowed me to have real not just financial stability, but financial success. It gave me the buffer to be able to then reach for something new and exciting because I had that kind of buffer to say, well, I don't need to work now for a year or two years. So I've got that space to be able to move on to something else. And so there were moments in my life when, you know, I, I wasn't really, a, you know, working for a living, but that was fine because I was building to, for the next big role. Um, and so I always say to young people that, you know, do have great fun in your careers, but also do try if you can early on to 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 go for that financial stability and take those risks, which give you the returns, which then give you the freedom to be able to do more and more. Because ultimately, what is I mean, you know, what is what is the point of earning money? It gives you freedom. It's not just about putting food on the table and a shelter over your head but beyond that what it does is it gives you the freedom to make choices and that's what I always say to people that you know that if you can aim for that in your early life and you can you know you're lucky and privileged enough to be able to have that then get even braver because I think sometimes you I know when I was um when I was in my legal career and I had my own practice and it was doing incredibly well, I did have friends and family saying, why would you give all of this up to effectively go to nothing again? Uh, and because, and I, I kind of thought, well, you know, I never envisaged that I would have this. And the fact that I do means that, you know, I'll kind of bank that and now move on to something else. Whereas I think sometimes people feel like they can't bank it and move on, that they have to stay there because that because I think it creates too much instability I yeah. think they, they, the sense of losing everything that they've made uh, stops them from actually 
reaching for something even bigger and better and more exciting. Um, and I think, it, I suppose that's what I mean by be brave when you're in your careers and be brave to make that next move as well. Yes, of course. And that moves on to my next question, really. What advice would you give yourself looking back? Have a bit more fun. A bit more fun? I think you a bit more fun, yeah. You know, I think in my 20s and 30s, you know, I, I, I don't think it helped. I don't think my first marriage helped, but I, I think I was quite miserable. And because I was quite miserable, I did spend all my time just working, which made, which, you know, which made me hugely successful in my career, but I'm not convinced it actually made me very happy. And so I think, I, and now I'm having far more fun in my life. And I just wish I'd started to learn to have a bit more fun a little bit earlier on in life. I mean, even in government, I think I was so focused on the job that I don't think I ever really managed to enjoy the time I was there. So I think, uh, you know, I, I, I talk about lots of things in my career, but I think the one thing that I probably would do differently now, looking back on it, would be to have a little bit more fun in each of those roles. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really important, isn't it? to enjoy your start, yourself and your yeah. team, as well yeah. as in, you know, the professional. It does sound, though, you know, the sort of careers you've chosen, it's, you wouldn't put maybe law, criminal law, politics with the word fun. It's quite, it's quite yeah. difficult to do that, isn't it? But I'm sure yeah. there are areas that you can enjoy the, the time that you've got. Yeah. And I, and I also think that I didn't take much time off work. I was a complete workaholic. I mean, in my 20s and 30s, I was a complete workaholic. Um, in fact, you know, I would say probably until about, you know, a few years ago, I, you know, I was doing 80 hour weeks all the time, every week. And, and I think, you know, just to some extent, I think COVID has been a, a bit of a, 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 a moment to reset. Yeah, a moment to reset and just work out. You know, I think, God forbid, if, if you know, I, there's so many people that I know that we've lost. And if that had been it, I think I would have had a lot of regret at this moment thinking, well, yeah, I had a great life and a great career and some amazing moments, but actually did I ever learn to live? And I think COVID has probably focused my mind on starting to live a little more, which is why, yeah, which is why I decided to just stand up comedy. That's amazing. And I've, asked, yeah. I've now been asked to do Strictly, which I don't think I'm going to do. <laughs> no, I think you should, absolutely. <laughs> I'm kind of, oh, I just don't know whether I'm up to Strictly. Yes. It's, uh, it might be a step too far. <laughs> I think we need to start a campaign to get you on Strictly. Definitely. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm speaking to the guys about it, actually, because they, they reached out to me and said, we'd like to talk to you about the next series. And I'm like, oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> what did you say? Trapeze moments. Take your chances. I know, but this trapeze moment, I might break my legs and my arms. I don't no. think I, I don't think I'm 50 and menopausal. I really want to be having dancing dress. Oh, that would be amazing. Which would be your partner, your favorite partner? Oh God, you know what? It'd have to be Anton de Beck. Yes. Simply because I think he's I think it's classy. He wouldn't do trash. He wouldn't do trashy kind of dancing. And I wouldn't want to do trashy dancing. And also Anton and I do as uh, packed lunch together as well. You see Steph's packed lunch together. So we know each other really well. We've got a really good rapport. But having said all of that, no, Lindsay, I won't be doing Strictly. Oh, no, you have to. I'm going to start a campaign. <laughs> um, oh, it's been amazing to speak to you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. And good luck. And stay, stay safe while you're observing Ramadan. What a difficult time to do Ramadan when the sun's shining out there. I know, I know it is. But, you know, it's, uh, it's again, Ramadan is a moment to stop and think and reflect. And, um, you know, I think we need, we need that in our lives. Do, definitely thank you so much i'm just going to press stuff on the recording so just give me one second thank you very much